Hello, students of Dynamics. This is Dr. Dan Baker with an example today looking at relative motion of particles. And the specific example we're going to take a look at is if you're going to throw a ball out the window of a moving car and you want to hit a target. Okay, so you have some information that you can throw at 50 feet per second and due to the geometry of how you sit in the car looking out the window that you can you're going to throw at an angle 15 degrees ahead of the x-axis so we can see here's our x-axis over here that's going to be horizontal so we're talking about throwing here 15 degrees ahead of that and so there's three questions that we want to ask relative to this and the first one is do you throw when the target is ahead of at or behind the car okay i've drawn it here where the target would be ahead of the car and you think that would be the appropriate location or right when you are at basically horizontal um, at the same y coordinate as the target or would you want to be on the other side of that the next question is to identify the relative and absolute velocity terms Okay, this is a really critical point on any of these relative motion problems. If you cannot identify the correct relative and absolute terms, you won't be able to solve many of these problems accurately. Okay, so instead of me just going through and doing that, I would like you to try parts A and B by yourself, uh, or if you're studying with someone with the folks you're with, before you um, see the, what the answers are. Okay, so go ahead and pause the video and see if you can answer parts A and B. All right, hope that was a fruitful thought process conversation that you had. The really critical part of this one is trying to figure out if the velocity we're talking about, this 50 feet per second at 15 degrees ahead of the x-axis, is that the absolute or is that the relative? The way that you can always decide that is what is it with respect to, okay? It's with respect to you in the car. So if the car was stationary, it would be absolute. Okay, if the car didn't have this 20 feet per second velocity, but the car is moving, it's going forward at 20 feet per second. So that, so therefore, this makes it the relative velocity of the ball relative to the car equal to that 50 feet per second. Once again, because it's relative to a moving car. Okay, the absolute turns out to be an unknown value. So let's list these out. We have the velocity of the car, the velocity of the ball, and the velocity of the ball relative to the car. Right? Remember, the relative is always relative between the two absolute terms. So let's make a little table with this. The first column here, I'm going to put the magnitude. And the second column here, we'll put the direction. All right. So the velocity of the car, we know that the velocity of the car is 20 feet per second and it's going vertically in the y direction. Okay, let's take a look at the velocity of the ball relative to the car. We also know its magnitude. It's 50 in feet per second and it is going at an angle off and on these, I just kind of draw a little diagram to say, hey, I know this angle here is 15 degrees. All right, so if there are six total terms among these three vectors, one magnitude, one direction for each of three vectors, we basically have six total possible unknowns, and we've identified four of those as known values, so therefore we don't know the, the magnitude of VB, we also don't know the direction of VB. Now there can be problems where these unknowns will be split Maybe you'll have one unknown as the magnitude of one vector and then another unknown as the angle of another vector. Okay, so these unknowns don't have to be tied to the same vector term. So let's go ahead now and write an equation that relates these vectors. Let me go ahead, put these vector arrows above here because these are all vector terms. If they weren't vector terms, they'd only have a magnitude, right? If they're just a scalar value, but because they have both a magnitude and a direction, they are vectors. All right, I'm going to go over to black ink just because everything um, is all about velocities and things in this problem, so I'll just make it unified. So our relationship. We know we're looking at the velocity of the ball relative to the car. Therefore, I can write my equation. Then on the left-hand side, I'm going to have the velocity of my ball. That's going to be equal to the velocity of the car 
plus the relative velocity of the ball relative to the car. Okay. Now I could also, if I wanted to, draw a vector triangle to relate these terms. That vector triangle, I will go back to my brown for this one. I tend to draw velocities in brown. So here is the velocity of my car. I'm going to add to that this relative velocity of ball relative to car. I'm going to add to it because I look at this side of my equation and I can see that I am adding together two vectors, right? So adding on tip to tail, there is the velocity of my ball relative to car. And that on the other side of the equation, right, I'm going from to the exact same locations on either side of this equation. And so fundamentally here, I need to start at the same start and end at the end. I get there with one vector, which is VB. Okay, so you certainly could take this triangle. You could figure out some angles. We have 15 degrees. We have a 90 degree angle there. We know the values of VC. We know the values of velocity of ball relative to the car. You basically could look at a, excuse me, a law of cosines to solve for the magnitude of VB. I'm going to take more of a vector component approach. And the reason I'm going to take that approach is that if you look at part C, it's talking about how far ahead or behind the target should the car be, right? So we know this um, distance here, right? Delta X is the 30 feet, but we need to find basically delta Y. So this is what we're solving for in part C. In order to find that delta Y, I thought it'd be better to have my velocity in components. And if I go with a vector component approach, I'll end up with components instead of needing to work through the magnitude and angles then to come up with components, right? But it's really um, either way, we'll get you there. All right, so given our fundamental equation, given our table of, of knowns and unknowns, we can go ahead and write these, these different terms out. Okay, so VB, just defining all of these components. The velocity of the ball is completely unknown. Now there's two ways we can express that. One way is express it as VBX comma VBY. Now I'm gonna go ahead and by observation assign a sign to this X component. And I put a negative out front, and that negative out front because I have my x axes given over here going to the right, and I know that the velocity is going to be going to the left. So, so I'll be in a negative x value. So if I get a positive value for VBX, I know that I was right. I could also write out VB as two different unknowns, and those unknowns would be, uh, I still could put the negative out front if I wanted to, magnitude VB times the cosine of some angle theta. Now, if I am using cosine for the x, I'd be talking about this angle here. Right? If I was using sine for the x component, I'd be using the vertical angle off of vertical down onto that vector. Okay, that would be the x component and then vb magnitude times the sine of theta. Okay, so noting that there's two unknowns in each one of these equations. I just express the knowns either as components or as an unknown magnitude and an unknown angle. It turns out that most of the time, this is gonna be your preferred format. And the reason for that is that you don't end up with multiple unknowns in each of our equations as we move forward. Because really what we're gonna do here is gonna come up with the components in the X and the Y for each of the three vectors, plug them into our fundamental equation up here, and then solve for the two unknowns. Okay, so carrying on with defining these vectors, we know VC is more straightforward. It only has one component in the Y direction, so zero comma, we said it's moving upwards at 20. Now all of these will have units, feet per second, and then the velocity of the ball relative to the car has that magnitude of 50. And then using the 15 degree angle, once again, this would be negative because it's in a negative x direction. So 50 cosine of 15 degrees, and then a positive y direction, 50 sine of 15 degrees. Gives me those components. I'm gonna go ahead and do the math real quick on those. Uh, we end up with values here of negative 
296. And the Y component, 12.94, once again, in feet per second. All right, so the next step that we're going to do, and I'm going to go ahead and put it here beside, just so we keep all the information here on one view, is to take my fundamental equation, and I'm going to split it into an X version and a Y version. Okay, so my X version tells me that basically VBX plus, or excuse me, is equal to VCX plus VC slash BX. Okay, so the X version of my starred equation and I'm going to go ahead and put these values in. Unknown VBX is equal to 0 for VCX. And then I'm going to subtract off 48.296 as my relative velocity X component. With this, we can find that VB sub X is equal to 48.296, that's in feet per second. Now we assumed it was going to the left, we got a positive value and so it confirms it is indeed going to the left. We then can look at our Y version of that equation and the Y version we have unknown VBY is equal to 20 plus a positive 12.94. So therefore, V, B sub Y is equal to 32.94 feet per second. Once again, we got a positive value confirming our assumption that it has a positive Y component. All right, so the, not, the last step to this problem, if we were simply asked to find those components, we would have them, but we wanted to find out how far and it turns out you need to be behind the target. Okay, hopefully you all got that. Um, taking a look at parts A and B. You want to be behind the target because the car is moving forward. The ball is also moving forward. And so with both of those, um, you need to be behind the target. Uh, if you were at the target, you would overshoot it. And of course, if you're past it, um, you would completely overshoot it. And so um, we're going to dig back to is our kinematics equations out of chapter 12. Okay, so our kinematics equations, I'll write out the X version and the Y version. Um, and that is that delta X is equal to my initial velocity in the X times delta T plus my acceleration. That's one half of the acceleration in the X times delta T, that whole thing squared. And the Y version, delta Y is equal to my initial velocity V not in the y times my elapsed time delta t plus my one half a y delta t squared. All right. Because we're looking at a planar view, right? A planar view like you're looking down from a plane. We actually don't have to worry about the acceleration. In this case, the acceleration would be in the z direction. Okay, and so we're not worried about the overall elevation of the ball. And so, and we're also going to ignore air resistance. Okay, so with those two things, we can assume the acceleration in the X and the acceleration in the Y are equal to zero. Now, the whole air resistance ignoring is actually a function of velocity. If the velocities are moderately slow, it's not a bad assumption to ignore air resistance. As the velocities get higher, it's a worse and worse assumption to ignore air resistance. So we're going to solve, you know, here's our target, right? We want to solve for this delta y. And, but in order to do that, I need to figure out what delta t is because I have two unknowns currently in this equation. I have delta y, also delta t. But on the left over here, I only have delta t. Okay, so let's solve the one here on the left first. Uh, the distance. Now, because we're using um, an axis system and because all of these distances are vector terms, while the overall distance is 30, as it comes into this equation, it needs to come in as a negative 30, okay? Because the delta x is actually changing from an x of 0 to an x of negative 30. So its change is, is negative 30. And when we put in that negative 30, then that matches up with our um, VBX velocity, which is a negative 482 nine six and that's times delta t so our delta t is therefore equal to 0 0.62 seconds 
Okay, now we can bring that delta t over here into this equation and then solve for delta y. So we find that delta y is equal to our initial y velocity is the sum of the car plus the ball's vertical velocity 32.94 times 0 0.62. We end up with a delta y value equal to 20.46. Okay, so this would be the distance that you need to be behind that target as you're throwing the ball at the window at 50 feet per second in order to strike the target. Okay, of course, you might be able to figure this out um, with, with trial and error, but as engineers, we like to be able to predict things. We predict things with math. And so we see that you could mark off a distance, 20.46, as long as you release the ball at that point, then you would strike this target uh, with the ball. Hope that was a useful example, taking a look at the vector component approach, but also showing that you could use, if you wanted to, more of the vector geometry and more of a graphical approach and the law of cosines. This table of knowns and unknowns, I think, is a really important thing um, to draw in, basically to list out all of those terms, get your head around the problem, figure out what you know, what you don't know, so you can continue to move forward. We can see in this problem we did need to reach back into our particle motion equations in order to solve what was asked for. If we had just simply been asked for the velocity itself, we could have stopped um, with the components for the absolute velocity of b in the x and y. I hope you're having an awesome day.